Hello, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome to this Instagram live session uh, where we're going to talk about emergency medicine as a career option in India. And I'm uh, thankful to uh, the two panelists who've joined us and both of them are very experienced in this field. And they would help you in uh, knowing more about this branch, which is I would say a relatively new branch and a lot of uh, students have a lot of questions regarding it. Uh, so I'm joined by uh, Dr. Dachna. Dr. Dachna is an assistant professor in emergency medicine at uh, KMC Manipal. And she did her emergency medicine training at Ames uh, Delhi. Um, hi, Dr. Dachna. Thank you for uh, taking out time. Hello, sir. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I'm also joined by Dr. Devansh, uh, whom... Uh, I'd uh, taught a few years back and I bumped into him at the airport and that's how I got to know more about emergency medicine. Uh, he's currently uh, doing his senior residency from Ames, uh, Delhi uh, in emergency medicine. Uh, hi, Devansh. Thank you for taking out time. Hi, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to, uh, you know, young doctors who are interested in emergency medicine. Right. Perfect. So I, I would also so. like to share that I was coached by you as well, sir. Long back. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great, Dr. Dachna. Uh, so I think so the time is, uh, timing is perfect because the INICT results are out and the counseling is going on. And I got a lot of queries regarding emergency medicine. Uh, students wanted to know what exactly does this branch entail? Because a lot of them think that uh, med as medicine PGs also they're posted in emergency medicine and as surgery PGs also they're posted in emergency medicine. So what different is an emergency medicine person doing uh, there? Uh, that would be my first question to both of you. Um, anyone uh, can go first. Um, Ma'am, you can go first. Uh, 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 I agree, sir. Like as medicine and uh, uh, so, um, what to say, surgery pages they are posted as well. Uh, the thing is, when patient comes to the hospital, he comes in undifferentiated. Uh, say, for example, uh, I always give an example of altered mental status. It could be, sorry, it could be a stroke. It could be some tox. It could be uh, hemorrhage. It could be just metabolic cause of encephalopathy. And at that point of time, the patient is also unstable in terms of a lot of physiological parameters. So as uh, the role of emergency medicine comes in here, where you are in an uh, uncharted area, undifferentiated without a diagnosis and an unstable patient. So uh, we, our primary role comes in, in stabilizing that patient, identifying what is the possible reason for that uh, presentation, and then involving the definitive uh, branch which will be involved in further management so uh, it yes yeah, so initial much. triage assessment and then calling the necessary branch which would ultimately take care of the patient if i have to just yes. summarize that perfect devansh uh, can you also elaborate regarding what all procedures are you people performing because a lot of students are saying that uh, is it just a role of triage and initial stabilization or are you people also involved in the care till the uh, till the ultimate specialty where the patient is going to go? They come to the emergency. Are you in, also involved in um, actual procedures uh, which yeah. are done on the patient? Yes, sir. So this uh, this question is will be an extension to what you asked previously to ma'am also. So uh, triage is one part of emergency medicine. Uh, as after the patient comes in the department. Uh, or in the emergency, as ma'am said, the patient would initially be undifferentiated. Now, as you very rightly said, initially, sir, patient, uh, like, you know, surgery PGs are posted, medicine PGs are posted. Emergency medicine, I would say, links both of them. And an emergency medicine person would be able to manage the initial emergencies, both medical, surgical. And I would also go on to say that, uh, be it OBG emergencies, be it pediatric emergencies, be it urological emergencies, all of them, the management of all those emergencies, uh, by the end of your emergency medicine residency, you would be proficient in doing. So for example, uh, let's take a patient of stroke, sir. So as you rightly said, till what point would we go? So if you read guidelines of stroke, it clearly says, what all do you have to do at certain specific time points? And that those time points have to be managed. So as an emergency physician, you would read those proper guidelines and manage each stroke patient in the same manner, which probably a surgery resident who has not managed that during his residency and is posted in the emergency might find slightly tough 
or would would like to defer to his medicine uh, colleagues so for example a patient of stroke comes we initially uh, assess the patient the patient might be hemodynamically unstable so we manage the airways the breathing the circulation and we follow the stroke protocol we do a uh, random blood sugar we send the patient for ct scan if the patient requires uh, thrombolysis we thrombolyze the patient in the ed itself if the patient uh, uh, has a hemorrhage uh, and patient requires blood pressure management we do that so the stabilization of the patient is done in such a way and the definitive manage or management or the final step for example if the patient has an ic bleed and requires uh you know decompressive craniectomy we involve the neurosurgeon if the patient has a malignant mca infarct and requires prolonged icu care we involve the neurologist and the patient is shifted to the neurological icu so this is a very typical medical emergency that a patient might have similar case would come with surgical emergency so an obstructed uh, or a strangulated hernia so a patient might have sepsis a patient might be you know in shock so a uh, patient might have perforated so how to manage the patient uh, in the sense of pre operative optimization in the ed if i as a surgeon sir you would agree that a proper pre operative optimization of the patient if it is done in the ed before the patient is shifted to the od it would help you and the anesthetist to you know yeah. bring the best yes absolutely and it patient. would also improve the surgical outcomes so exactly, in sir. short if i have to summarize that so basically uniformity of care in uh, any emergency situation is uh, what you people are bringing about uh which you rightly pointed out that supposing a medicine or a surgery pg or an obs gynee pg is post sr is posted there they might not know the how to manage the emergencies of the other branch and another and sir uh, just one more yeah. thing i would like to ask uh, i just like you talk to talk, talk to us about the procedures so uh, there are certain critical care procedures that we perform for example intubating a patient uh, okay. performing iv lines performing intraosseous lines performing central lines uh then there are certain surgical procedures so patient requiring chest tube patient requiring uh, you know chest decompression patients who have come with urinary obstruction requiring spcs i have done spcs trauma patients requiring orthopedic reductions uh, splints uh, so all these things come under the purview of emergency medicine and the initial stabilization of the patient yes sir perfect so i think so you people have adequately covered uh, the scope of the branch and one of the questions asked was how is it different from internal medicine i think so we've adequately uh, discussed that uh, so to both of you my uh, the first question is that did you take up this branch out of choice uh, if yes what were the reasons behind it uh so sir i definitely took it out of choice and i'm not just saying that right now uh, since my ug days what i wanted uh, in my mind was always to have a broad base of specialty so i never uh, thought of uh, you know specializing in a single uh, narrow specialty from my ug day so i was always in search of a branch which was broad based at the same time sir i never you know had any particular uh disregard for either surgery or medicine a lot of people are like i won't do surgery or i won't do medicine i just like surgery i like both of them i like uh, uh, the aspects of both of them so i was in search of a branch which gave me the these three elements it should be relatively broad based i should be able to assess a patient from head to toe right to left front to back and i should um, also have uh, experience and knowledge about both surgical and medical aspects so that is when sir the icing on the cake came when one of the uh, residents who had passed out from aims delhi in fact in emergency medicine came to my ug institute and was doing sr ship and i saw him managing emergency patients in a very holistic manner he did not require consultations from various departments to manage a specific patient he could stabilize the patient to his baseline status and then maybe for definitive care he would call the other person and that really attracted me sir perfect uh, what about you dr rachna uh my story is a little different i didn't know the branch existed till i opted for it um i just went for the counseling i saw it in the list and then i spoke to the same person who devansh was mentioning about he was in a post grad resident then okay. and uh, discussed with him and i had a lag period of uh, say a couple of months for my neat result to come out so i said let me just join and uh, see how it goes and then i enjoyed uh, that particular experience and i continued in the same perfect yeah uh what about uh, future plans so ma'am you have already joined as an assistant professor so you are going to continue there 
uh, Devansh, what are your future plans? And one of the things which uh, was told to me initially, and my perception changed when I bumped into you at the airport, Devansh, was that you told me that all uh, it's it's now a mandate for all the aims and the central institutes to have an emergency medicine department. Is that mandate going to be rolled out to all central institutes uh, or all government control institutes? Uh, if that is the case then the opportunities and the number of uh, seats in the government uh, setup are going to open up as faculty positions as well. Yes, sir. So, uh, so to first answer the first part of the question as far as like what my uh, like uh, future plans are, sir. Uh, what I feel is that like as I have uh, done this specialty and now I have uh, done my MD, I realized that this specialty has a lot of room to grow in India and uh, a lot of uh, knowledge gap is present as far as this special branch is considered, including the field of research in emergency medicine. So what I would like to do myself is to stay associated with a government institute uh, in an academic branch where I could, uh, you know, uh, grow myself as well as teach and uh, do research. And then if, uh, you know, wherever life takes me, probably uh, like, uh, become a consultant and continue to do, the, to do the same. And the second part, sir, uh, uh, you are absolutely right that the government of India has taken out a mandate, mandate, mandate saying that for UG recognition, uh, it is uh, required that all institutes should have a functioning emergency medicine department. And uh, I think, ma'am, uh, can elaborate more on that. I think it is for all institutes, whether they are government, central institute, or state, or even, I think, private institutes, ma'am. Yeah. It's for uh, all medical colleges for UG recognition. Uh, emergency medicine, having an emergency medicine department has been made mandatory. Previously, uh, I remember during internship, we had 15 days of uh, casualty posting. Uh, so we want to change the terminology from that casual approach to focused approach that is emergency medicine. So uh, the mandate came out saying that it is mandatory by 2022. I think they've given an extension due to COVID and other logistics uh, uh, roadblocks that happen in between. But yeah, the jobs are going to increase exponentially at least in the next 10 years. Yeah, and so and there's sir, no saturation uh, yeah. uh, right now, which is uh, there. Exactly, sir. And so, uh, as we all know, I, I think there are more than 20 new aims that have come up. Uh, from the original six newer aims, including Raipur, Jodhpur, uh, Bhuvneshwar, and uh, uh, Rishikesh have already Rishikesh. had emergency medicine departments. Yes, sir. And all of them would have them. All of them would hire faculty. So there would be no dearth of uh, this thing in central institutes, even state institutes, and uh, even private institutes for that matter. And the topic that is told about the saturation part, sir, that is also one of the things that people have told me, and Rachna ma'am would be able to uh, elaborate on that, is the, the fact that because this branch is relatively new and there are lesser emergency specialists, the positions that you would be able to acquire at a younger age would be much, you know, higher than if you go into a relatively saturated branch, maybe, you know, cardiology or neurology, where you, to become a professor, you know, you would still be probably one of the most junior, most professor in an institute. So that is what it is. Right. So also, let me give you my perspective regarding this. So uh, I was, uh, once I finished my fellowships, I was uh, in a corporate hospital. So corporate hospitals had emergency medicine departments and they were usually, uh, you know, running uh, fellowships and those fellows were then joining uh, there. But in, in corporate setups, what I saw was that the growth wasn't there, right? It was, uh, um, you know, they were stuck at that position for a very long period. And that's when a lot of churning was happen happening and a lot of frustration was also setting in into some of those uh, students. But with this new initiative which the government has taken up and with this the new number of uh, seats which are opening up in government institutions, I think so the scenario is going to uh, change. So uh, this brings me to my uh, next question. Uh, so uh, what about those who've done a fellowship in emergency medicine versus those who are doing a post-graduation in emergency medicine? How do you feel? Uh, is there a difference? Uh, and uh, I mean, will that also amount to a difference uh, when they apply for jobs? Uh, shall I go ahead, Devansh? Yeah, Hi, yes, yeah, please, ma'am, please. Okay. Uh, so, to be very frank, when we started off postgrad, 
we were trained not by emergency physicians but by people from medicine anesthesia surgery orthopedics different departments and the same was happening for the fellowship courses as well uh currently the scenario is changing most of the postgrads are being trained by emergency physicians themselves that is first point second point uh, people find the fellowships as a easy pathway because uh, you can skip all the entrance exams and the stress that comes with it or the uncertainties that come along with it also, however i think so say uh, i'm sorry i'm interrupting also but uh, i think so this is relatively new so those who got into this branch say 7 uh, 8 years back at that time a lot so many pg seats were not available so that is why they opted for fellowship True. opportunities True, yeah. and uh, they end up having some have three-year training programs, some have one or two-year training programs. But at the end of the day, though they are uh, skilled to manage patients to some extent, uh, the courses are not recognized. And yeah. uh, as you mentioned rightly, the same corporate setup tries to uh, employ them for a lesser salary, and uh, they find it as a easy pathway so that uh, they know that they don't have any other options. the only option which remains is probably getting an mrkm or an mle and moving abroad so there is no academic growth there's no professional growth and at the same point of time uh, since they are not in the academic community the progresses which is happening or the newer advances which are happening it's difficult to be in loop and uh, they get stagnated frustrated and all these things so i have uh, had so many students approaching me regarding joining these fellowships i still feel that it's better to uh, say delay one or two years and join a proper md program if they are planning to stay in india and continue in india so definitely it has better job opportunities better a future in terms of a lot of other things people who do fellowships sometime do prepare for mrkm and plan to move abroad like for good however after that if they do want to come back to india again they have to start from zero so these are the drawbacks okay. of so you uh, have your reservations courses. regarding fellowships and uh, personally knowing the current scenario with so many emergency medicine seats opening up in central institutes and government institutions i would also my suggestion would also be to go for a post graduation rather than a fellowship okay so one thing which students are confirm uh, con- views about are the job opportunities so let's let's simplify it for them one pathway is what you people have chosen that you do your post graduation they want you want to be in the government setup so that is one of the pathways where you can join as an assistant professor associate and continue there ma'am you've joined a private institution but manipal is you know a, a high volume center and you are also going to continue in the same pathway now what about those who want to join a corporate hospital what kind of uh, job opportunities are there number one corporate if you people can elaborate and number two some people are saying in as a private in a private setup can an emergency physician work as an intensivist so that was a question which was asked to me by two or three students ma'am uh, i think you would be able to answer okay. that by that uh, yeah. okay so in corporate hospitals again like there are posts for say internal medicine neurologists cardiologists there are posts for emergency physicians as well uh, it is a little stressful compared to uh, say being in a medical college because you have more hands along with you to work and resuscitate however there are few corporate hospitals which are running dnb programs teaching programs so they can join there as well uh, second thing is regarding uh, regard regarding the private uh, okay yeah, so tell. regarding private practice in emergency medicine uh, i'm just uh, reiterating some of the anecdotes or like some of the things which i've heard from the west there are something called stand alone eds where uh, there is a emergency physician running an emergency setup stabilizing and referring patients however given indian scenario i think private practice or starting your own setup for emergency medicine is going to be a little challenging and cumbersome as well uh, for the sheer requirement of a lot of resources uh, and also uh, since we don't have a good pre hospital uh, emergency setup right now transferring patients after stabilization most of these patients are critically ill so if a receiving center does not receive the patient in time there might be some issues so there is no good scope for private practice as of now 
Uh, in future, it may or may not come up given the Indian health scenario. I also uh, think in corporate hospitals. Yeah, I think it's either going to be a government-based uh, practice or uh, corporate-based practice. Uh, uh, private medical colleges, corporate hospitals as well, which are true. mainly running DNB programs or just the EDs. And uh, another thing, which uh, so you asked about private practice, yeah, uh, regarding intensivist. So we do uh, we do have a lot of overlap with the initial critical care. Say say critical care, we call it ED crit. That is uh, stabilization for the first six to twenty four hours. Say a DKA patient or a toxicology patient, we do have a lot of role. However, continued critical care is not our forte. Uh, people do some fellowships and go into that. Uh, so it's personal choice. Perfect. And uh, what are the DM options after uh, emergency medicine? Are there any DM options? Some students are asking that. Yes, sir. So uh, as of now, uh, the main DM option that we have is critical care, critical care mm -hmm. medicine. So uh, as I was just seeing in the comments, uh, sir, I personally feel uh, we are posted in ICUs, the uh, critical care ICUs during a residency also, and I feel that. critical care medicine is a natural extension of emergency medicine so uh, whatever we do in the emergency a patient comes in an undifferentiated state probably in extremis we stabilize the patient and patient requires an icu care the patient is transferred to the icu managed by the intensivist and then when the patient becomes better he might be discharged or may be transferred to a ward who is managed by a medicine person or a surgeon so that is how a normal continuum goes so as of now critical care medicine is a viable option uh, it is right now available as an option in neat uh, not currently available in inict uh, other than that sir uh, yeah so I, i think as of now that is the only option that we have ma'am is there anything else that you would like to add um there are newer branches coming up that is pediatric emergency medicine yeah, right. which is available in couple of central institutes toxicology Uh, DM in toxicology. Uh, these are the newer branches. Uh, so the ones we are expecting. DM in toxicology. Whom else do you compete with while giving the uh, DM? Ma'am, that. Uh, uh, so clinical toxic. Yeah. So that DM. Go ahead, Devanshi. Is a forensic toxicology uh, DM mm -hmm. being offered uh, right now? As far as my knowledge goes, in AIMS Raipur. So that is by the Department of Forensic Medicine. Uh, right. I think clinical toxicology would come up in the future by the Department of Emergency Medicine itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, being a relatively newer branch, and uh, obviously, as we talked about, there's no saturation of emergency medicine only. So first, uh, this thing about emergency medicine is to fill the emergency medicine. But DMs in these sub specialties, for example, emergency cardiology, emergency pediatrics, uh, emergency uh, critical, like you know, M grade kind of a thing where you do. Uh, after emergency med medicine, some in intensivist thing would come up in the future. As of now, it is critical care medicine uh, in DMs and uh, pediatric emergency medicine being offered by a couple of institutes. And as ma'am said, forensic toxicology. Perfect. So, uh, ma'am, you are in a private institution. Uh, students want to know the pay scale. Once you did your uh, post graduation, I want broad figures or a range. I don't want exact values. But uh, you would also be knowing okay. the people who are working in corporate setup. So once supposing they've done their post graduation, they've done their uh, their senior residency, and now they join a corporate setup as uh, uh, as a junior consultant, or uh, you've joined as an assistant professor. So what are the pay scales, and what is the financial growth like vis-a-vis -vis medicine or surgery? Okay, uh, so when I came out as a post grad, there was a lot of demand for emergency medicine. A lot of institutes wanted to start up. So. Uh, in terms of senior resident uh, compared to my contemporaries in say medicine surgery we were the highest paid senior residents in a private setup say we started off with 1.6 1.7 as srs right. and as then SRs. as aps we moved as srs That's yeah great. and great. i have had uh, my uh, contemporaries in going to corporate setups private setups uh, with a starting salary of 3 3 plus as well as however consultant. currently because as consultants post md without with zero experience wow. uh, joining as consultants so this was few years back so currently since the number of residents are more obviously like it happens in any other branches it slightly come down however uh, the starting salary is around the same in most of the uh, say uh, private medical or uh, 
uh, corporate hospitals in government hospitals anyways it, it stays fixed across branches uh, so i would also, like to also do you also think that it is slightly more in tier 2 cities as compared to tier 1 cities because that's what we find in surgery like if you're planning to join a corporate in a tier 1 city they won't pay that well but tier 2 city they'll pay well so is that the same case for emergency medicine also uh, that was actually not the same case because this was similar in delhi hyderabad mumbai as well Okay. because uh, at that point of time it was a demand supply mismatch which was happening so uh, i'll i just want to uh, elaborate a couple of points on why why they exactly want to invest on emergency physicians mm -hmm. so uh, emergency physicians say a patient of uh, dk uh, managed by an emergency physician in the first 24 hours uh, has better outcome in the sense the patient we can reduce the icu stay by say Uh, say five to seven days to down to two days can be go uh, can be going down to HDU and then getting discharged. Uh, the scenario in polytrauma cases was that the neurosurgeon would come see the CT uh, and go, and then the surgeon would come probably look at the thorax and abdomen, give a CTVS reference for a hemothorax or a rib fracture, ask for an ICD and then go. Uh, there would be an open fracture. The orthopedician would. come do they are but and then go and that patient would be stuck in a uh, decision making process for a long time so once emergency physicians have come since we are able to tackle all these things at once and do the stabilization and the initial part like we can intubate for low gcs put an icd for massive hemothorax activate mtp for a fast positive which uh, does not require immediate surgical management we can probably monitor the lactates and resuscitate uh do the uh, put a pelvic binder uh, open fracture give the antibiotics we, that this is done in less than an hour and then mm. we decide upon what definitive intervention is required patient goes so the overall patient outcomes benefited that was bringing in a lot of revenue for the hospitals it was having better patient outcomes the bed turn critical care and hdu bed turnovers were higher so that's why that's when probably people started investing more on emergency physicians paying them more and getting them to corporate hospitals and this thing and since the uh, senior doctor is there on the floor uh, probably patient interaction communication with the patient rather than a uh, junior resident or a junior doctor uh, cmo and post mbbs doctor staying there calling everyone on the floor and getting things done versus a single person who's doing everything it had better patient satisfaction as well so this is why probably it started off that way with more people coming in i'm not going to vouch that the pay scale is going to be similar but uh, we are still paid in the similar range uh, so as there is started off time before saturation sets in as we discussed uh, that Definitely. you know there, there are i still see a few years before uh, these kind of problems start uh, arising okay coming to next uh, major issue and devansh i want you to go first here so uh, like when i was preparing for my usmle i did one rotation in uh, bronx this was a tier 1 trauma center there and um, you know it was i was in the emergency surgery team there trauma surgery team so it was a very demanding and a hectic uh, shift even though it was a shift call 12 hours but the nights were very demanding bronx invariably you had one or two uh, gunshot victims coming in every night from somewhere and you know you had aggressive uh, attendants patients so uh, overall it's a very demanding and and, uh, and you are always high on adrenaline when you're working in the emergency room so a lot of uh, students have asked what is the work life balance like and do, uh, what about a person who is suffering from anxiety issues can they choose it do you have to be in uh, what about the fitness level required to do emergency medicine if you can elaborate on that because you are in uh, aims right now which i think is one of the heaviest emergencies in delhi definitely sir uh, so sir okay. as you rightly said first of all uh, i want everybody to understand that emergency medicine is not opds we don't have opds we work in emergency departments uh, which are in government set up especially very high volume centers and there are shift duties so uh, as sir very rightly said the shift when you're on a shift the shift would be very hectic so you would probably when you you know enter your shift so we divide our emergencies into red areas and yellow areas depending so as per triage whether the patient is sick or relatively less sick can give time kind of a uh, patient so whenever you go to your shift you would probably have six patients lying one would be a vaginal bleed one would be a dk one would be a polytrauma patient uh, uh, one would be you know some strangulated hernia one would be a stroke patient so 
managing all of them, seeing the treatment priorities, uh, managing patients in an evidence-based manner does require you to be on your toes constantly. And sir, I would say that uh, people who, you know, <laughs> if you look at pop culture also, shows like Grey's Anatomy or ER, like Grey's Anatomy is a surgeon-based show, but what they generally do is kind of emergency management because showing ward work in a TV show would not fetch that much. But yes, so that is what you constantly do. You are constantly on your toes, uh, thinking about patients, uh, you know, getting them the proper care that they want. And at the same time, managing new patients as and when they come while you are stabilizing your old patients as well. So definitely the shift uh, during that shift, it is hectic. But at the same time, sir, emergency medicine is a team based concept. You are not alone. You're not the sole person on the floor at any point of time, you will have your seniors, you will have uh, your SRs and even consultants who would form a team like a particular batch and they would be on floor with you. So that, uh, you know, the team handles all, all of this, all of this together. And after your shift is over, the responsibility shifts to the next shift. So whoever is coming as a team in the next shift, the, these people take over. So you kind of get to de-stress. You, you do not really need to take work home. You do not do no not follow need up to, is required. Uh, think, yes, sir. You do not need to think about the patient after you, your shift is complete. And some people might take it as a negative and some people might take it as a positive. That's a personal choice. The next day when you come, you don't have to probably deal with the same patient as well. So that is what uh, it is all about. So as far as work-life balance is considered, sir, once your shift is over, uh, you can relax, you can uh, invest time in, you know, uh, academics, uh, research, leisure, whatever you feel like. So it is not, uh, you do not really need to take uh, work home. Ma'am, anything else you would like to add to that? Yeah, probably you've summarized it all. That's the thing, like when you're there, you're there 100%. When you're out, you can switch off and concentrate on whatever you're doing then. So, Dr. Ratna, you are probably uh, a few years uh, elder to Devan and you have been in this branch longer. So, do you think it has taken a physical or an emotional toll on you? Uh, frankly, the thing is, uh, night shifts and all these things keep on reducing as you go further in your career. Hmm. We still do a uh, few night shifts. Uh, if people ask me if I get a chance to choose again, I, I still would choose emergency medicine for... It's given me good work-life balance. Uh, in the sense, I'm able to be there 100%, give my 100% when I'm there. When I'm out, I'm switching off and concentrating on something else. It takes a while to get used to it because there is still a hangover of that uh, emotionally or uh, stress-free loaded shift which comes back with you. Even though we say we switch off and come back, you've done a recess or you've managed a very sick patient or there's a young patient death which happened you get some of it back home uh, you have a little bit of hangover especially during covid times we've all had tough times coming back home about not being able to do the best or probably non-availability of resources not being able to orchestrate things better but with time you learn how to manage it you know how to uh, take whatever is required probably improve yourself and keep two things separate as it happens in most other branches, I guess. So, so uh, yeah. Uh, more mental conditioning is also required if you're taking up this branch. So like you rightly said, uh, not getting all the additional baggage home is very important for a, a long career in this uh, field. Otherwise, uh, people do tend to burn out. Like I know American figures and I know uh, people who are working in the emergency medicine space in America, they go through a lot of anxiety issues and burnout issues. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's still in its nascency in our country, uh, but I think so more mental conditioning is definitely required for an emergency medicine person. Definitely, sir. And uh, just to add to what uh, ma'am said, or maybe, you know, just elaborate on what she said, uh, emergency medicine, you are always on the front line. So if there would be some disaster, be it like a trauma-based disaster, a natural disaster, or for that matter, COVID. COVID was a disaster. So being in the front lines does take its toll but at the same time it also gives you the confidence this is a very important thing that i feel that during covid personally it gave me so much confident that confidence at the time when 
you know, especially during April 2021 when the Delta wave wave hit and there were no beds for anybody. Like people from ministers to probably consultants and hospitals, nobody was getting in any any beds or anything. And we have all managed uh, COVID at home personally. So it gives you that confidence uh, that you have the knowledge and the skills to be able to manage uh, even your near and dear ones, or for that matter, any patient to the best possible way that probably anybody can do at that point of time. So that is very important. And as you rightly said, sir, mental conditioning is required. And uh, initially, it might seem like chaos. But as you grow in both experience and knowledge, you learn to find the order in that chaos. And just sure. one uh, one line that I would like to say, one of my, one of our consultants and one of our faculty members very commonly says this, that when human intelligence meets animal diligence, an emergency physician is born, which is, I think, very, uh, you know, aptly summarizes that. So I want you to repeat that once more for everyone, uh, Devan. <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, Asa says that when human intelligence meets animal diligence and emergency physician is born. And both those things are very much required when you manage emergency, sir. It is not just, uh, you know, calling other branches. It is very much, uh, you know, yourself managing the patient to the best possible way. Perfect. Uh, so just uh, want to add in, yes. sir. Uh, yes, yes, yes. It, it actually makes you better in your own personal life as well. Like as you grow, you learn to manage crisis and chaos so better that whatever happens in front of you, you are calm, you're finding solutions, you, you're thinking what to do next. So uh, an anxious person can have two pathways in the career. They can get more anxious in the beginning and they might feel that, okay, fine, they cannot continue and quit or they might stay and learn and be more uh, organized or like overcome that anxiety in a better way in both personal and professional life. True, true. I completely agree. And you know, my exposure there in America in one month, uh, it was tremendous exposure. And that definitely helped me when I was doing my residency here. And I always narrate this incident uh, of uh, trauma where, uh, you know, I encountered this boy who was in a scooty without a helmet. He fell down, tongue was severed completely. And I shifted him to Sabdajan and, uh, you know, to stabilize the spine. I didn't have a collar at that time. So you learn Jugaad as well. So I had my Sebastian and my Bailey's on one side each uh, yeah. in the car to stabilize the neck. So definitely makes you more confident um, and helps you deal with uh, emergencies in a better manner. Thanks. So uh, one more question uh, for you is that uh, we've spoken about doing this from AIMS and central institutes. Would you be able to just enlist a few other institutes who, uh, which are good for uh, emergency medicine post-graduation or DNB for that matter? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So, so uh, ma'am, please go ahead. Uh, it's okay, Devansh. Yeah. Uh, sir, so... Um, Apart from AIMS, JIPMER has a very good emergency medicine program which is running. And oh. uh, in in AIMS, like if I talk about, apart from AIMS Delhi, AIMS Rishikesh, AIMS uh, Raipur, AIMS Jodhpur and Bhubaneswar. The, uh, all these departments have people uh, who have been running this department for almost, I think, five, six years at least. And now pass out from uh, our own institute and other institutes are going there. I think apart from that, uh, a lot of neat... Uh, like state medical institutes such as uh, uh, BJMC has a program. Uh, I think as ma'am told me, I think South India has uh, many more programs of emergency medicine as compared to North India. Ma'am, would you like to elaborate on that, please? Uh, yeah, South India uh, has actually more concentration of uh, the colleges which provide emergency medicine residency in terms of both DNB and MD. Uh, KMC Manipal, St. John's, JSS Medical College, uh, Jubilee Mission in uh, Kerala and a lot of other uh, DNB colleges as well. They are uh, equally good, especially in Bangalore alone. I think uh, Ramaya, Vaidehi, more colleges in South India compared to Central and North India. North India, it's predominantly AIMS, AIMS like institutes and couple of DNB colleges as well. And uh, the good part is, I think it's the same for others, like uh, colleges which are providing DNB with more than 500 inpatient bed capacity are considered equivalent to MD. They get the same uh, opportunities as an MD resident. And uh, the colleges with DNB programs with less than 500 inpatient beds will have to do an additional year of senior residency. And then they are considered equivalent. So we do have a lot of faculty from DNB as well. A lot of colleges in Tamil Nadu, um, Sri Ramchandra, 
more concentration more in, in south india compared to central and north definitely okay. so i think so the next burning question i guess maximum number of comments are regarding mrcm so can you elaborate on that and can you also elaborate on uh, you know opportunities abroad for somebody who's done their md or dnb in emergency medicine in india uh yes sir. so uh, i personally have not pursued this but i have uh, got this information from one of my seniors again who has done his md from aims delhi and who has now moved to uk after doing mrcm so uh, basically mrcm first of all is now called frcem so don't get confused with that it is the same thing uh, it is a three step examination so step 1 is basically pre and para clinical subjects step 2 is called sba single best answer which is uh, again an mcq based exam but it is then core emergency medicine which is clinical questions and then step 3 would be an oski so you would have you know stations where you would need to demonstrate your practical skills so you would have an atls station an acl station bls station resuscitation all these things would be covered in that examination all three uh, steps have to be done in india now uh, you don't need to go outside for that and um, after that you can if you, when you get your mrcm and you pass that you get you are you can apply for the gmc registration and uh, after you get your gmc registration you can apply for uh, institutes in the uk uh, so what sir said that um, to become a consultant so there are a lot of pathways he said the most direct pathway is something like when you join the you become a registrar so if you just after mbbs if you do that you start at something called as st1 so there are stages from st1 to st6 and after st6 you can give exams and uh, uh, complete their basic uh, requirements and then become a consultant there if you do your md uh, or dnb in india that per se is not recognized but that they recognize it as an experience of working in an emergency department for 2 to 3 years and you get a lateral entry directly at probably st3 and st4 so it's so the same as those... mrcs same same as yes. the surgical uh, specialty so if if you've done your pg from here and then you go there then you join as an st3 or a specialty registrar and then you work your way up and it usually takes like you rightly said 6 or 7 years to reach the consultant position yes yeah, so, so it is same as mrcp or mrcs as you said sir yes what if somebody wants to bypass uh, a residency here and straight away give it after under graduation mrcm uh, would you be knowing anyone who's done that because a lot of people do mrcs that way and i don't see any reason why mrcm cannot be done yeah i think uh, i don't know anybody personally sir but that is what sir said i think if you do that i think you will directly start at, at st1 ma'am uh, do you have any other yeah so uh, as you mentioned sir a lot of these fellowship courses when initially md uh, program started uh, there were a lot of uh, these courses which were being banned and tagged fake and uh, and it was sometimes fake because they were just running it getting revenue out of it and not training people so then what they have done is they've clubbed it with the mrkm prep true. program true. so post mbbs they work as junior residents or sometimes in one of these fellowships they prepare for mrkm and then they move there however uh, uh, whether they go at st1 level or st3 depends upon probably their logbook and the competencies which they've achieved so based on the competency they assess if the person has had a genuine training in emergency medicine and is competent enough based on their oski and the logbook they might be taken at st2 or st3 level if not they start from zero again right so what i was reading was that you need to show at least 6 uh, months to 1 year of experience before you appear for the mrcm uh, exam you need to show 1 year of experience in emergency medicine so the same is the case for mrcs as well they have to get a, a thing signed by somebody saying that they worked in surgery for at least 2 years and then only they can appear for the mrcs exam so it's the same for mrcm as well uh another question which is coming up is somebody who's done their mrcm and they want to come back to india and practice right uh, of course government setup is out because you don't have a valid indian emergency medicine degree so it has to be in corporate setups uh, what is your opinion regarding that uh, dr rakesh frankly i don't know of any such sir they might be uh, i think it would be same as other specialties as well but uh, to be very frank i don't know of any such uh, pathways so, or usually what happens that. in surgery is if somebody's done their mrcs or frcs there and they want to come back then corporates do welcome them 
and uh, unlike uh, surgical branches where you know when they come back they still take time to establish their practice they won't get patients from day one uh, what is different in emergency medicine is that they don't need to have their own patient base patients are going to flow in so uh, i know of a few people who've been called by corporates to set up their emergency medicine departments and to set up the curriculum for training as well so yes opportunities are there I, as more and more uh, you know corporates open up uh, but usually what i've seen is somebody's done their mr mr came and if they work, they work there for a few years they rarely come back uh, to uh, india right uh, perfect uh, any further questions uh, please write them in the comment section um, closing remarks uh, uh, dr devansh dr rachna anything else which you would like to add uh yes sir. so uh one thing that i would like to add is that after doing emergency medicine i am very happy that i took this branch frankly speaking sir because it gave me what i wanted first of all a broad based specialty and secondly sir the confidence with which comes uh for example if any patient uh, uh, like you know just to add to why i took it initially i always used to think uh, so for example if a patient is having headache and that patient goes to a neurologist the neurologist would probably make a dd of probably you know some ic bleed stroke some intracranial mass or something like that i realize that a person who has specialized in a special branch uh, in a specific branch kind of over a period of time start neglecting other things so he would probably never think that it could be something in the eye probably a glaucoma attack or probably something in the ear causing him headache so to be able to think like that and to be able to manage a patient holistically is what i've gained uh i've already talked about confidence so i would highly recommend it to anybody who is looking for uh, that broad based no, broad based knowledge and the confidence to manage emergencies perfect so couple of questions which i just want to address uh, i think so we've already spoken about scope in uk uh, gulf countries is the same if you've done from here there would be corporates which would definitely hire you there and give you a good uh, package if you have an mr chem uh, like you for mrcs if you have an mr chem as well then your uh, salary in the gulf countries uh, doubles or triples uh, that's the same for mrcs as well um so that was uh, one and again i think so dr rachna and dr devansh both both have said that uh, rather than doing just a one year uh, emergency medicine fellowship or a program it is better to invest your time in three years uh, as an emergency medicine uh, specialty um parting comments from you dr rachna so i i would definitely tell people that uh, choosing a branch is more about what kind of person you are and what you're expecting from your professional life there are people who want to have a uh, continued communication and continued relations with the patient in the sense that doctor patient relationship getting that continued uh, uh, what to say feedback from them uh in emergency medicine we don't have that so uh, we we have a hit and run kind of uh, pattern where we see patients sometimes patients may not even remember us they are not conscious enough to register our faces uh, again night second night. thing is uh, one night stand <laughs> yeah kind of <laughs> i wouldn't put it that way but <laughs> yeah so and uh, second thing is uh, many people who want to start their own private practice currently there is no scope a uh, third thing is uh, regarding night shifts which people keep telling uh, i think there are night shifts in cardiology in neurosurgery even in surgery or anything for that matter here we know when we are doing our night shifts we know uh, when we come out of it probably there it's uh, comes unanticipated so and i in our institute even radiologists are on night shifts still they are aps by the way to give expedited reports for uh, a uh, quality assurance of the hospital so do i don't shift, think other than dermatology when do night shifts stop for an emergency medicine person approximately uh, we do it till we are associate professors i think in corporate it's going to continue till probably like it happens in any other branches yeah so uh, for people who want to opt emergency medicine we've definitely told about the positives few of the drawbacks we've mentioned as well i think you all should probably go and see how it functions once and then take a informed call there are people who would enjoy uh, emergency medicine and would not want to do anything else there are people who might feel stuck because of these few things 
in the sense if you want to switch to your own practice or if you want to have that feedback from the patient you want the patient to remember you and come back and thank you some other day that does happen in emergency medicine as well but not frequently yeah. as in say medicine or surgery where you have that okay this is my doctor or this is my physician that kind of uh, uh, feedbacks are not there so uh, probably yeah this is one thing which i have been telling everyone who's asked me given a chance today and i get to opt again i will choose for emergency medicine being in this field for around 7 to 8 years great great so thank you thank i you. think so dr devansh and dr rachna have beautifully highlighted the scope uh, of emergency medicine and have also highlighted certain traits for people uh, who should go in for this uh, branch i am sure you would still have questions if you have any further questions please do write them in the comment section i will take the help of dr devansh and dr rachna and i would help you out uh, you can also note down their instagram ids uh, and you can uh, send them a direct message if you have uh, any further comments regarding uh, the branch uh also if uh, you like the session if you want us to make another session any other branch just write it in the comment section i'll try to figure out people who are uh, the right people to guide you regarding that uh thank you very much for joining in uh, dr devansh dr rachna thank you for taking out time thank you thank you so much sir thank you sir thank you, thank you sir